What about the span of a set that contains only one vector? That's the set of all scalar multiples of that vector, which we saw earlier is the line through the origin and the point corresponding to that vector. It's a one-dimensional structure. What about the span of the empty set? We saw that this is just the origin. That's a zero-dimensional zero object. What about the span of two vectors? In this case, that gets you all the points in the plane. So it's a two-dimensional object. What about the span of three vectors? Similarly, that's a plane in three dimensions. It looks like this. A plane is a two-dimensional object. This raises the question, is the span of k vectors always a k-dimensional geometric object? The answer is no. For example, the span of the zero vector consists just of the zero vector. That's a zero-dimensional geometric object. The span of these two vectors is a line, which is a one-dimensional geometric object. The span of these three vectors is a two-dimensional object, uh, a plane, which raises a fundamental question. Given k vectors, how can we predict the dimensionality of the geometric object that's formed by their span? So we've seen that the span of these two three vectors forms a plane in three space. And in fact, this is useful for plotting the plane. So here, here I've taken uh, multiple uh, choices of alpha and beta and plotted what you, could, what you get. So there's a more familiar representation of planes, which is this, the set of triples x, y, z satisfying an equation of this form. Now, we can use vectors to represent this same equation. So the set of vectors x, y, z such that this dot product is equal to 0. So we're describing a set of vectors using a linear equation with the right-hand side of 0. We can similarly describe a line in three dimensions by using two equations with right-hand sides equal to 0. So it seems we have two ways to represent a geometric object, such as a line or a plane. We can represent it as the span of some vectors, or we can represent it as the solution set to uh, a, a set of linear equations where the right-hand sides are 0. So we've got these two methods of representing things. One of the great themes of computer science is having multiple representations is very often useful. And we'll see it's true in this case as well. So for ex here's a plane represented as the span of two vectors, and the same plane represented as the solution set to this linear equation with the right-hand side equal to 0. Here's an example of a line. And this line can be represented as the span of this single vector or as the solution set of these two linear equations with right-hand side equal to 0. Each of these representations has its uses. For example, suppose you have two lines and you want to find the plane that contains those two lines. Let's say the first line is the span of this set consisting of one vector. The second line is the span of another set consisting of another vector. How would you find the plane containing both of them? Well, it turns out it's the span of those two vectors. So this representation is convenient for finding the geometric object containing two smaller dimensional geometric objects. Now, Suppose I want to find the intersection of two planes. Well, let's say I've represented one plane as the solution set of this linear equation. I've represented the other plane as the solution set of another linear equation. How can you find a representation of the line that is the intersection of these two planes? It turns out you want the, you want the points, the triples x, y, and z, that satisfy both these equations. So, by using this representation, we can get the line that's the intersection of these two planes. 
what's common about these two representations for sets of vectors that form geometric objects? It's a subset of, uh, in this case, r to the d, satisfying three properties. The first is the subset contains the zero vector. The second is if a subset contains some vector v, it contains every scalar multiple of that vector. And the third is, is this, if the subset contains two vectors, u and v, it also contains their sum. So let's see why the span of a collection of vectors satisfies these three properties. The first one is easy. The span of a, a vectors v1 through vn is the set of all linear combinations of those vectors. Here's one linear combination where you take every coefficient to be 0. That obviously gives you the 0 vector. So property v1 is satisfied. What about property v2? Well, let's take any vector in the set that is a vector in the span, which is a vector that can be written as a linear combination of v1 through vn. So we have a vector that's written at some linear combination. You have some scalar alpha. Then the scalar vector product, alpha v, can be also written as a linear combination of those vectors v1 through vn. You just multiply all the coefficients by alpha. Now for property v3. Property v3 states that if two vectors, u and v, are in the span, then their sum is also in the span. So let's say u and v are in the span. That means that u can be written as a linear combination, and v can be written as another linear combination. Well then, we can represent their sum by just taking the linear combination where each coefficient is the sum of the corresponding coefficients in u and v. Now let's turn to the other representation, the solution set of a collection of linear equations where the right-hand sides are all 0. Now, property v1 is also easy. Take the 0 vector and plug it in. Well, a1 dotted with the 0 vector is 0. a2 dotted with the 0 vector is 0, and so on. All the dot products with the 0 vector are 0. So clearly, the 0 vector lies in this solution set. Now let's turn to v2. Take some vector that's in the solution set. That is, all these dot products are equal to 0. And now consider whether alpha times that vector also lies in the solution set. Well, what's the dot product? a1 dotted with alpha times v. That's the same as alpha times a1 dotted with v, which is alpha times 0, which is 0. So similarly, all these linear equations also hold of alpha v. So that proves property v2. Now let's turn to property v3. Similarly, suppose you have two vectors u and v that lie in the solution set. Well, that means u and v satisfy all these linear equations. That is, the dot products are all 0. a1 dot u is 0, and so on, up to am dot u is 0. And similarly, a1 dot v is 0, all the way up to am dot v is 0. Well, then it's easy to see that the sum of u and v also lies in the solution set. Why is that? Let's look at the dot product. a1 dot u plus v is the same as a1 dot u plus a1 dot v by the distributive law. a1 dot u is 0. a1 dot v is 0. Therefore, their sum is also equal to 0. So this shows that all those equations also hold of the sum u plus v. Any subset big V of f to the d satisfying these three properties is called a vector space. So for example, we've shown that for any vectors v1 through vn, the span of those vectors is a vector space. And for linear equations, a1 dot x equals 0 up to am dot x equals 0, the solution set of all these linear equations is a vector space as well. Now, if we have two sets, big U and big V, and they're both vector spaces, but U is a subset of V, we call U a subspace. So for example, the span of V1 through Vn and the solution set of these linear equations with right-hand side equal to 0 are subspaces 
of r to the d. Here's a fact that turns out to be not so hard, but quite central to linear algebra, that every subspace of r to the d can be written in each of those two forms. Every subspace can be written as the span of some vectors, and every subspace can be written as the solution set of linear equations where the right-hand side equals 0. Now, a disclaimer. In a traditional mathematical course on linear algebra, a more abstract course, that we would take a more abstract approach. So we wouldn't define vectors as sequences or functions. Instead, we would define a vector space to be any set that came along with an addition operation and a scalar multiplication operation, any set that satisfied certain axioms and satisfied properties v1, v2, and v3. This approach has an, its advantages. Anytime uh, you give a more abstract definition of something, you don't have to be concerned with the internal structure or details of the, of the thing. In this case, we don't have to be concerned. If we took this approach, we wouldn't have to be concerned with the internal structure of vectors. This is analogous to encapsulation or, uh, or information hiding in object-oriented programming. The advantage is it's more general. Now, I didn't take this approach. I took a, a, a less abstract approach for this course because I think in developing intuition about vectors, it's helpful to have this concrete representation. Now, much earlier we saw that the u to v line segment could be represented in this way. Uh, it's the set of linear combinations alpha u plus beta b, where alpha and beta are non-negative and sum to 1. We say a linear combination of vectors v1 through vn is a convex combination if the coefficients all are non-negative and they sum to 1. For example, the convex hull of a single vector is a point. The convex hull of two vectors is generally a line segment, and the convex hull of three vectors is a triangle. So you would think that uh, the more vectors you have, the higher dimensional the object. That's not always true. For example, uh, uh, if these three points are collinear, they, they're in the same line, then their convex hull is a line segment. Similarly, if you have a bunch of points, and they're all in the same plane, then their convex hull forms a polygon. 